the recently concluded budget seemed to have a little something for everyone. A balanced one, you might say. Of course, for those of us who really want to nitpick, we can always find some deficiency with it, which is exactly what I'm going to do in this episode. Considering next year's general election, the budget was expected to be a populist one, where a lot of freebies were given to a lower middle class and poor, especially the rural population, which is the main vote bank. But our finance minister bit the bullet and resisted the urge to do that, and instead chose to tread along the path of fiscal prudence, where we conserve our resources instead of going all out on expenditures trying to please the masses. which is actually short term thinking so this budget actually builds a sense of trust and confidence especially to the international community and agencies like the IMF which always believe countries should use their resources prudently countries like sri lanka and venezuela went bankrupt because their rulers went overboard with populist measures in the hope of getting reelected So join me for today's video where I talk about what the state of our poor people are in India in the light of the recent Oxfam report on inequality. I also tell you what the budget had in store for them and what else I felt it could have done for the most vulnerable section of society. And guys, if you like such videos, please be sure to hit that like and subscribe button for more such financial content. We all know the lower middle class and poor sections of society in India have had it very tough for the last few years. An overzealous BJP government after being elected in 2014 went on an all out crusade against black money and wanted to bring about big bang reforms to formalize our economy. I am not faulting their intention. They meant well for the country. Nirmala Sitaraman in her budget speech announced that our economy has become a lot more formalized as reflected in the employee provident fund membership more than doubling to 27 crore and 7400 crore digital payments totaling 126 crore rupees were made through UPI in 2022 but they clearly miscalculated the effect this hurried formalization had on our weaker sections of society the black money which our prime minister promised would return and in fact he said he would deposit 15 lakhs in each account never managed to return but the effects of demonetization which was enacted to eradicate black money in india has lingered on till date in fact the only thing demonetization killed was a certain section of our cash economy and that to the one that belonged to our poor and i might add our real estate sector which was a massive job generating machine although more than 6 years after demonetization it's now finally picking up gst as well in the process of formalizing india's economy the informal sector took a bad beating and only big players benefited at the cost of smaller ones so the asian paints and burger paints of the world gained market share while smaller paint manufacturers lost orders because they didn't have gst registration of course it makes sense for all builders to purchase paint only from gst registered merchants as they benefit from set off of input tax credit they will obviously think only about themselves but why didn't the government consider small players that's just one example so many other informal industries from leather tanneries in kanpur to small textile manufacturers in surat all of them have suffered and add to this covid just happened at the worst time the lower middle class and poor were crushed even further and had practically no recourse left in mid 2021 A report published by the Azim Premji University said that since the past one year means from mid 2020 to mid 2021 230 million or 23 crore Indians had been pushed into poverty it further said that the rural poverty rate had increased by 15% and urban poverty rate was up 20% and went on to conclude that in the pandemic though incomes fell across the board The pandemic had taken a far heavier toll on poorer households who are coping by reducing food intake, borrowing and selling assets. But you might argue the report was published in the depths of the pandemic. Surely things have improved since then, right? Wrong. 
A study was released by Oxfam, which is a British not-for-profit group that focuses on reducing poverty across the world. Their Indian division published a report as recently as on 15th Jan 2023 titled Survival of the Richest. This report has a lot to say about the ever-increasing gap or inequality between the rich and poor. It says that 5% of Indians own more than 60% of the country's wealth, while the bottom 50% of population possess just 3% of India's wealth. And if we narrow this figure down, it says the richest 1% own nearly 40.6% of the country's wealth. This wealth gap has gone on increasing and India actually has the world's highest number of poor people while the total number of billionaires have increased from 102 in 2020 to 166 in 2022. There was a decline in poverty rate in India beginning from 1991 till the early 2010s and different agencies have reported different numbers on this front. But the broader theme does seem to suggest that poverty had reduced. But demonetization and COVID, and probably GST to some extent, have contributed to greater inequality in the country, and measures are needed to fix that problem. But first, the government must admit that there is a problem. In May of 2022, when inflation peaked to an 8-year high of 7.79% in the previous month, I was shocked to read that the finance ministry had released a statement saying the poor were less hurt by rising prices during the year as compared to the rich. This statement couldn't be further from the truth and was even contradictory to what RBI said. RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das, while announcing a 40 basis point repo rate hike on May 4th, has said, High inflation has pronounced adverse effects on poorer segments of population by eroding their purchasing power. So the Oxfam report correctly says that food inflation is the stickiest of the lot and since food is an absolute basic necessity, the financial pressures exerted by it force poor people to reduce their already low expenditure on health, education, clothing and shelter. Let's talk about taxation. The Oxfam report recommends a progressive system of taxation where the rich pay more taxes, whether that be income taxes or indirect taxes. Oxfam also recommends the government demand more wealth tax from our rich citizen to make up for the inequality. The government in 2019, in an attempt to encourage more investment by big companies, reduced the tax rate for corporates from 30% to 22%, with newly incorporated companies paying a tax as low as 15%. Again, you can't fault the logic. The government believed that instead of direct benefits to the middle class and poor, If investment is increased, it would create more jobs and would have a trickle-down effect on the economy. But this cycle takes time and they should have realized that inequality was on the rise back then also. Then Covid hit, adding further to that problem. So in hindsight, this new taxation policy resulted in a total loss of 1.84 lakh crore and they had to revise their tax revenue estimates downward by 10% in 2019-20. So what did they do to make up for it? Hike GST and excise duty on petrol and diesel while simultaneously cutting down on exemptions. And guess who GST and fuel taxes hurt the most? The Oxfam report estimates that the bottom 50% spend 6.7% of their income on GST for select food and non-food items. The middle 40% spend 3.3% of their income on the same, while the top 10% spend 0.4%. In 2020 21, the government earned just over 1 lakh 3000 crores less because of incentives and tax exemptions to corporates. This figure, I mean the revenue loss, just happens to be slightly more than what the allocation towards the MN Rega scheme or the Rural Unemployment Scheme, where money is given to the poor in rural areas who don't have jobs. The Budget 2023 had some tax changes for the middle class, the biggest being increasing the rebate limit from 5 lakhs to 7 lakhs under the new tax regime. Basically what this does is that anyone earning an income of 60,000 rupees per month, which a lot of middle class salaried people do, their tax under the new regime 
one where you can't claim any deductions on your investments and savings under section 80c is zero while the same liability in the old tax regime would be 46360 rupees if you don't claim any deductions which to be honest many people don't use the full limit of the deductions there were other few changes as well such as enhanced limits for presumptive taxation rationalizing tax structure etc but the increased rebate was the most important relief to the middle class but the government went ahead and made life easier for the ultra rich as well by reducing the maximum tax rate from 42.74% to 39% these are the kind of relief measures oxfam say contribute negatively to inequality now let's come to probably the most important socio economic factors that can help lift our country out from chronic poverty health and education india is among the countries with the least public health spending the amount allocated towards public health care including for research was 92802 crores although this figure was 13% more than last year it just forms around 2.06% of our total budget expenditure and close to 0.35% of our gdp usa for instance spends upwards of 16% of their gdp on healthcare the global average is somewhere near 6% of gdp the overall allocation for the education sector in the budget was 113000 crores which is an increase of 8.3% over last year this makes the expenditure on education just 0.41% of gdp usa spends close to 6.5% of their gdp on education the budget had a little bit for the agricultural sector and rural poor such as distributing free food grains worth 2 lakh crores setting up agricultural accelerator fund for encouraging agricultural startups and the word agritech found its way quite a few times into this year's budget suggesting that the government wants to introduce cutting edge technology in the sector fun fact india has not even produced one single unicorn in the agricultural sector which is basically a startup valued at more than 1 billion dollars The agri sector will also see a lot more digital infrastructure implemented over the next few years which will make the lives of farmers easier. But I think the best thing this year's budget had for the sector was increasing the target for agricultural credit to 20 lakh crores so farmers can get access to easier loans. There were of course other few things as well such as allocating money towards self-help groups and cooperatives etc. but no big bang reforms like what the modi government has become famous for and this is my issue although i'm sure the government knows how much the lower middle class and poor people are suffering there's no outright admittance of that fact and i'm sure they're smart enough to figure out that they have to do something big for the poor people if they want their vote bank in next year's general election and that's why i think they've played it very smart here see to keep the international agencies like imf etc happy and not go overboard with spending and having a large fiscal deficit india played it safe in this budget but i think the modi government has a trick up its sleeve it's going to unleash a barrage of populist measures to entice the poor closer to the elections maybe from october or november onwards we'll just have to wait and see so you could say by that logic the bjp is trying to kill two birds with one single stone 